Looking at the picture of this man, there is only one identification, a nice, kind, intelligent senior citizen. But if you read the biography and the career history of the grandfather, then the hair just gets up on one's head. He is not remembered in history as an outstanding scientist, which was actually true, but as one of the most brutal Nazi criminals who conducted inhuman experiments on people. Ironically though, one of Klaus Schilling's nicknames is the Good Doctor of Dachau. This is X War History, and today we will tell you about crimes as well as end of a man named Klaus Karl Schilling. Let's begin. The Scientist In the very beginning of this man's life, however, no one could have imagined what one of the most talented scientists and specialists in tropical diseases and in parasitology would turn into. Klaus Karl Schilling was born in Munich on July 5, 1871. In his hometown, he studied medicine, especially parasitology. The talented scientist, already in 1895, at the age of 25 years old, successfully defended his thesis and received the degree of Doctor of Medicine. And 10 years later, Klaus Karl Schilling became the first ever director of the Department of Tropical Diseases at the Robert Koch Institute. The next three decades of Schilling's life were inseparably connected only with that institute. A professor of parasitology at the University of Berlin, Klaus Karl Schilling, actively developed methods of vaccination against tropical diseases, and malaria in particular. The scientists did not sit around in the offices of the institute, but studied the problem on the spot, conducting research in the African colonies of Germany for several years. For his obvious merits in the field of vaccination and parasitology, Klaus soon received the honorable position of chairman of the Malaria Committee of the League of Nations, the kind of prototype of the modern United Nations. One of the messages actively promoted by the scientist himself was that vaccination, as well as just experimental studies of vaccine samples against malaria, does absolutely no harm to the human body. At that time, no one could have imagined that this thesis would soon enough become a death sentence for hundreds of only confirmed captives and infected. Italian phase Of course, in Germany itself, especially after World War I, there was limited opportunity for research. The colonies were taken away, so Africa ceased to be a practice area. And so it was a coincidence that in 1936, Robert Koch, its founder, left the institute. Along with him, Schilling left the institution and relocated to Italy. The scientific's practical findings and conclusions were more than interesting to Benito Mussolini's fascist government. The fact that during the Italian-Ethiopian War, Mussolini's troops were struck by a fairly serious epidemic of malaria played a role here, so the arrival of a prominent scientist in the field was obviously most appropriate. Klaus himself in Italy stated that his research was of practical importance not only to Italy, but also to his native Germany which at the time had extensive plans for the conquest for world domination. Therefore, it is not surprising that Schilling's scientific research in Italy was also funded by a special grant from Hitler's Nazi administration. For the next five years, until the year 1941, Klaus worked in Italy with the full support of the Mussolini government. In an attempt to provide the scientist with experimental material, two clinics in Volterra and San Niccolo de Siena were placed at his entire command. Everything would have been alright if, in fact, these clinics were not clinics for the mentally handicapped. In other words, Klaus Karl Schilling received as experimental material the patients of the psychiatric hospitals. Regretfully, the general results of the scientists' activity at that time have not been sufficiently studied. Information about that period was either deliberately destroyed or classified in such a way that it cannot be found even nowadays. Thus, it is difficult to say how many unfortunates were victims of this man's experiments. But indirect evidence suggests that Obergruppenführer SS Leonardo Conti, who occupied several important positions in Hitler's government, took a serious interest in the findings. Head of the National Socialist Medical Alliance and State Secretary of the Imperial Ministry of the Interior for Sanitary Affairs and Public Health. Thanks to Leonardo Conti's protégé, Klaus Karl Schilling was introduced personally to the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, who suggested opening a special research laboratory at the Dachau concentration camp. And understandably, a world-renowned professor was asked to supervise the laboratory, Dachau Science Center. While not the first of the concentration camps established by Nazi Germany, the Dachau concentration camp received the status of a modal camp. It was here that the methods of mass extermination were practiced, 
and it was here that the main scientific research was carried out, in which the subjects were the imprisoned. By 1942, when Klaus Malaria Laboratory was organized, pseudoscientific research in a broad range of fields had already been going on at the Dachau for quite some time. For this purpose, the notorious Hauptsturmführer SS Sigmund Rascha put so-called medical tests on stream. A cancer research laboratory was established at Dachau. Experiments were conducted to improve the survival of people at high altitudes and in cold water. Experiments on so-called warming in low temperatures. Frankly insane research in blood cessation based on a preparation made of beet and apple root pectin. And equally as insane experiments to increase the fertile age of women. Speaking of which, the only success of Russia's supposedly medical research was the infamous cyanide ampule, which was used by many of the highest echelons of the Third Reich at the end of the war. But at first, the effectiveness of the ampule was also tested on inmates. Malaria laboratory. That is why there is nothing surprising in the fact that Klaus Karl Schilling fell into the environment of like-minded people who fully supported his research. By the way, an unusual fact is that many German scientists even at that time were categorically against Schilling's methods, but sadly nobody bothered about their opinion. As part of the malaria vaccination research, according to the investigation, at least a thousand prisoners were officially recruited as test subjects. However, this is an official and proven record based on preserved documents and the testimony of surviving witnesses. Considering the overall scale of the Nazi experiments in other spheres, it can be concluded that many more prisoners took part in the experiments. In this case, during the trial after the war, for some reason only the malaria laboratory was mentioned. But in reality, Schilling also directed other laboratories that were engaged in research in the discovery of treatments for tuberculosis, phlegmon and septicemia. The method of infecting prisoners with malaria was quite simple. The subjects were placed in cages and had their hands tied by spreading them apart. Then mosquitoes of malaria were brought into the cell. Having infected a patient, treatment was then begun. The strange part is that during the investigation no one mentioned Schilling's use of anything positive in terms of vaccines. On the contrary, according to official data, between 300 and 400 patients died. More than half were left disabled for life with irreparable injuries and chronic diseases. Some progress has undoubtedly been made in the treatment of fever by Schilling, yes. But surprisingly, however, patient deaths had more to do with obtaining the drugs than with the methods of treatment. It has been documented that in Schilling's laboratories, prisoners were injected with various doses of potent drugs. The quantities of the doses ranged from the smallest to the deadliest. During the trial in the case of the United States against Martin Gottfried Weiss and Wilhelm Rupert, when the surviving employees of Dachau, including doctors and including Schilling, appeared in the jury, witnesses described many of the doctors' experiments quite thoroughly. For instance, a witness, the priest Friedrich Hoffmann, stated that some of the test subjects in Schilling's laboratories were priests, with the number of religious officials who died of malaria numbering in the hundreds. Another witness, August Wiedeck, testified that in some of the laboratories, in addition to priests, citizens of the USSR, Yugoslavia and also the Poles were mostly sent to Schilling's laboratories. Although there was plenty of indirect evidence that more than a thousand prisoners, if not several thousand, had died as a result of the, we can say by now, so-called doctors in human experiments, the military judges officially declared that only 400 prisoners had died and that the health of those who remained and survived to be released had been irreparably damaged. In either case, Klaus Karl Schilling was sentenced by a military tribunal to death by hanging. The sentence was carried out by hanging on May 28, 1946, in Landsbeck Prison. That is it for today. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe to the channel and get notified when new videos come out. And also, leave a like.